making plans for night you This boy is electric Hi everyone, welcome back to the EV Puzzle. Time to talk about solar generation and one of the issues that I've just overcome. The normal process that I've gone through for the different solar arrays that I've installed is you instruct the installer, they make an application to the DNO on my behalf, I get approval for an export limit, and then we get the install done. But for our last install with the garden solar, that didn't quite work out that way. Our export limit hasn't been changed. So how have we overcome that? How have we installed more solar, but not increased our export limit? In theory now, we have 11.7 kilowatts of solar, I think. That's the actual power of all the solar panels added together. But depending on the orientations of where the solar panels are pointing, there's a maximum that we can actually generate. But the DNO, when they set their export limits, base that upon your inverters. So it's the potential for what you could export. So it's your inverter limits that they're particularly interested in. Not necessarily the solar panels that go behind it. So my 3.68 kilowatt inverter, which was a G98 application, that has 3.9 kilowatts of solar panels, but the DNO only cares about the 3.68. My solar edge inverter is two kilowatts, but I have 2.4 kilowatts of solar panels. The DNO only cares about the two kilowatt solar inverter though. So what's happened is I've been set a limit of eight point, I can never remember what it is, 8.2 kilowatts I think as my export limit. And before I put the garden solar in, I was below that. And I was definitely below that in what we can possibly generate. When we installed the garden solar array, the six panels, 2.4 kilowatts with another solace inverter, that took us over our limit. So of the amount of solar panels that we've got can potentially generate more than the 8.2 kilowatts. And we can potentially export more than 8.2 kilowatts. The inverter power definitely takes us beyond that. So how have we installed the garden solar array and keeping within the export limits? Hardware wise, what you want is an inverter that can detect how much export is going on. So a connection to the grid. So a meter, a CT clip that can see the amount of import or export that's going on. And if it sees export beyond a limit that you set on the inverter, then it ramps down the amount of power. The way it normally works is you have a list of approved equipment and that equipment is capable of meeting the rules and regulations for connecting to the grid and limiting the amount of solar power. So if I try to explain it in layman's terms, you've got solar panels that produce DC power. That comes into your solar inverter and that converts or inverts the DC power to AC power into your house. If you don't consume it, it goes out to the grid. So if you have something inside the inverter that's capable of seeing how much you're exporting, then it's capable of making a decision and saying you're already exporting the limit and therefore let's not invert anymore. Now it does something technical and something complicated to actually make that energy disappear. So you are producing it, it's produced at the solar panels, it gets to the inverter, but then it's not inverted. Some of it is lost, some of it disappears. And I believe that's called clipping. So the DNO are happy to approve those sort of configurations where you limit what you can actually export and therefore the generation won't take you over and above. And that's what we've done with this garden solar array. We've installed a meter with the Solis inverter the Solace Inverter has a parameter called backflow, and basically that's just export. So it's looking at the meter, looking how much you're exporting, looking how much you're flowing back to the grid, and basically making a decision on what it can allow through the inverter to, into your house and therefore out to the grid. So that's the backstop, that's the hardware solution, that's the official solution for how we're installing more solar than our export limit. If you're installing a system from scratch, one of the things that you might want to consider if you've already got a lower export limit but you want to install more solar panels is to install a hybrid inverter. A hybrid inverter then takes that DC power from the solar panels and puts it into a DC battery before it gets to the house, before it gets inverted and sent out to the grid. So by putting it into a battery, the inverter isn't having to invert the power. So you can actually generate more than your limits, you can process more than your limits, and until your battery is full, then it won't do any clipping. Once your battery is full, if you're still generating too much, then it will clip the rest. So hybrid batteries are a good thing if you're in that sort of situation, but I'm not working that way. I've got AC connected everything. 
So one of the things that would be nice to do is if I've got a large amount of clipping going on, if I'm losing a lot of solar generation, one of the things I could do is turn some things on. Because if I turn things on and consume the solar energy, then I won't be exporting as much. And if I'm not exporting as much, the inverter won't do the clipping. So I can generate nine or 10 kilowatts of solar power potentially, so long as I am consuming it, not exporting it. But that leaves me with the situation about, do I really want to turn stuff on and what can I turn on? I can't really turn the Zappy on or the Eddy on because the My Energy systems aren't really responsive enough. I mean, I, they can turn on and it can work and I can time them to come on and that will reduce what we put out to the grid. But it's, it's not as accurate, it's not as real time, it's not as flexible, it's not an ideal solution. So the Zappy and the Eddy heating hot water isn't really the best sort of solution. I could do things like, um, if I know it's going to be a sunny day, if the forecast was right and if solar reaches a certain level, I could turn the eddy on. I could turn it on early at, say, I don't know, six kilowatts of solar. But I could turn it on to a really low power. I could turn the power rating of the eddy right down and just heat hot water at, say, 500 watts continuously. That'd be a way of doing it. I could increase my base load, basically, the consistent amount of energy that I'm processing during the day. And that would be a way of limiting my export. But I'm heating hot water that I don't need to be hot. I'm turning things on and, I don't know, you know, creating this larger base load artificially just to produce more solar, just to make my solar generation number higher. So that's a bit of a waste too, isn't it? It's like turning on heaters in summer just to use the energy. What's the point of that, just to get my solar generation number higher? What I'd ideally like to do is do something useful, do something practical, do something beneficial with that solar energy. And that's what I've done. So talking about responsiveness, the first thing I need to be able to do this is to be able to have real-time accurate information. And I'm lucky enough, or I've been smart enough to choose a system that actually does have live real-time data. So my Victron inverter that handles the charging of our batteries, that does have live information. It has live information for our solar. I can see all of our solar generation live. I have that piece of data updating every three seconds. Uh, we have the grid import and output. We have the grid import and export. That's again updated every three seconds and that's extremely accurate. And then also there's the battery power as well. So that's live. So the Victron system sees my entire solution and it sees it in real time. Plus it gives me that data through Home Assistant as well. It's an open interface, so I can see all of my data in one place. So Home Assistant is a really good option for bringing data in from Solar Edge, from Solace, from My Energy, from Victron, bring it all into one place. And then I, I can do things like show graphs, show data, look at history, analyze it, but I can also make decisions based on that data. There's some code in there for automation doing if this, then do that, etc. So I can actually control the system as well. The Victron inverter gives me full control of what it's doing, charging wise, inverting wise. It's a very, very flexible system. So I've got the data, it's real time, it's live, and I've got the ability to put some code in. So if I reduce the amount of charging of my battery overnight from the grid using cheap rate energy, if I reduce that, so I only charge to say 80%, leaving a 20% buffer at the top, then that 20% could be what I basically charge during the day if we're exporting too much and basically we're going to do this clipping. This is where it's good to try and visualize what we're doing. Basically, we've got um, this sort of chart which shows our solar generation. And you can see a sort of straight line across the top. And that straight line is where it's basically not able to invert anymore because it's reached a limit. Now, this isn't the export limit. This is just the limit of the inverter in this case. But it shows what's going on. If we didn't have those limits, then the spikes would be higher at the top. You'd have all these spikes at the top of the solar panels being maxed out rather than the inverter being maxed out. And the difference of cutting those spikes off is like, I don't know, new, new growth on a bush. And then you're coming along with a pair of shears and cutting those clippings off the top. You're clipping the top of it, clipping those spikes off. So it's a case of what I want to do is leave all of those spikes, but use them as consumption, not as export, not as clipped uh, generation. I actually want to consume just those spikes. 
Now, so far I've found it better to start an automation looking at how much solar we're generating rather than how much we're exporting. So I'm trying to control export and looking at export but I'm trying to make decisions based on how much solar we've got. And the reason for that is because once you've made one decision, say my solar goes up to eight kilowatts and I make a decision and I use some devices to add some consumption on the system, then the export goes down. So if the export's gone down, then it's okay to take away that automation, take away that consumption, and it'll just go back up and back down and back up and back down because the export is what we're looking at and the export is what we're changing. So for me, it makes more sense to look at solar generation and make decisions on that and for that to influence the amount of export that we have. Anyway, that's what I've found so far in my automations. You might have different opinions, you might be doing it differently yourself, but that's working well for me. So what I'm gonna do is have several automations, one looking at um, the amount we generate at eight kilowatts, 8.25, 8.5, 8.75, 9, and on each different level of solar generation that we see, I'm going to change our in, I'm going to change our Victron inverter so that it is charging our batteries to a different level. I can control the number of amps, the number of watts that we're actually charging the batteries. So if I'm 250 watts over where we need to be, I can charge the batteries 250 watts. If we're 500 watts over, I can charge it at 500 watts. So the higher the solar generation goes the more I can increase the amount of battery charging that's going on once we reach a certain level of solar generation. And that is working really, really well. It's able to match what's happening in real time and make decisions quite quickly. So if I show you here what's happening on our system when we are not trying to clip, then you can see we've got a nice zero line that we're not charging the batteries and nothing is happening. We're just using solar energy. But when we introduce the automation and look for the excess of solar energy, this is the sort of chart that I'm gonna get in future, where you can see these spikes of where we're charging our batteries using that amount of extra generation that would otherwise have been clipped. So it's a very good chart to visualize that that's battery charging we're looking at here, but it looks like those spikes that I was talking about, that clipping would basically cut away and cut the top off. So if we take a look at it actually working, so this is my view from Home Assistant, the three important pieces of information here are the solar generation, the amount of import or export that's going on, and the battery power. Now obviously what we're doing is turning the amps down to zero, so we're not charging the batteries at all, but we're generating lots of solar and therefore we're exporting it, and hence we don't need to consume any energy from the battery. So what's happening here is that solar generation is gradually increasing. It's a cloudy day and the clouds are just starting to clear. So generation is increasing and the amount of export is increasing. Once the generation reaches a certain level, the home assistant automation is going to trigger and set the Victron inverter to actually start charging our batteries. That will add some consumption, that will add an AC load, and that will reduce the amount of export that goes out to the grid. So we shouldn't ever reach the point where the inverter has to say, no, you've gone over the limit, let's start clipping all of that wonderful solar energy. And there it goes. We're now charging the batteries and reducing the amount of export that's going on. It works, and it works really well in real time. What I need to do now is start to improve these automations, adding some extras in there to cater for all situations. What if the solar jumps from 8,000 to 9,000? What if it goes 8995, then comes back to 81? What if it drops 20 seconds below 8,000? Do I carry on charging? So what I need to do is improve those automations to maximize the amount of solar energy that we can actually prevent from being clipped and we can charge it into the batteries instead because it's a positive outcome once it goes into the batteries, because it means I don't have to recharge the batteries with that energy overnight at a cost of seven pence a kilowatt hour. I'm making an actual savings. So it's actually really using that solar energy constructively, not turning something on wasteful just to artificially increase the numbers. So I'm very happy with this result, and that's why I thought I'd share it with you and share the experience of having more solar panels than your export limit and how you get around it. But don't forget the DNO don't approve this sort of home assistant software based solution. That's not official enough. That's not um, guaranteed enough for them. What they need is a hardware solution that can guarantee that you can't go over that limit. And uh, that's what we've installed with the meter and the Solus inverter. 
Thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed this video, hope you found it useful. Uh, let me know in the comments if you're doing anything like this as well to optimize your system. Now I know some people don't have battery solutions where they can control it to this sort of level, but if you're thinking about adding a battery to your system or installing solar and battery from scratch, it's something to really think about. You need live data and you need the ability to control your inverter in all respects. And if you don't have that, then you can't cater for this sort of thing. It's a great thing to have in your arsenal to be able to adapt to things that go on. Anyway, let's leave it there. Thanks again for watching. Take care. See you again soon for more videos. Bye for now.